<laughs> yeah. yeah, I feel like singing a Fiona Apple tune. <laughs> no, but it was it was like I watched the documentary and that I remember would, thinking cause, I, cause I was that guy that thought it was like pot was fucking terrible. I, I grew up thinking pot was the devil. You should never smoke it. It's worse than booze. I'd watch my parents get wasted when I was a kid at fucking parties. And I, and I, and I remember before I started using cannabis because I replaced all of my alcohol consumption with it in the last three years. All of yeah. it. I don't drink anymore. Um, and, I, and I remember thinking. Listen, I drink. I have enough going on in my life. I've got an, I've got enough yeah. vices. I don't need to have another one. Yeah. And it's and it's not only not a vice. It's a fucking it's a medical component for people. Like and well, and, you're, and to you're, think about how we were lied to to get to that point drives me crazy still. Well, when you're especially what you're seeing now with psychedelics for traumatic brain injury and everything coming to the forefront, right? It was like marijuana yeah. they knew some people were clever enough to know that that was the gatekeeper to open up everything else to being looked at differently. And you're seeing it now. I mean, the therapeutics with marijuana for some people, I always preface this because it's not, you'll also get the hippies that'll say it's the cure all for cancer and everything too, which that's not true either. Right. But it's, yeah. you know, we are seeing every time we talk people, about, weed, every time we talk about weed on the air, we get a uh, weed cures cancer. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Rick Simpson oil. Yeah. Every, no, and, and, every well, and here and here's the thing. I, like, so we interview those people, right? And even interview the oncologists and stuff like that, yeah. and said, "Look, one of the first things I prescribe to my cancer patients is cannabis for treatment." Because what a lot of people don't realize is it isn't necessarily the cancer treatment that's always the killer for a lot of people. It's the medication you take to like prevent or supposed to help you or to help you and deal the effects with of treatment it. With chemo and radiation, right? Right. And this mm -hmm. is where they're seeing a non toxic or the LD50 of cannabis is off the charts, right? They've injected mice with amounts that they thought would have killed humans and it doesn't kill them. Sure, they're tripping balls for three or four days, but they don't <laughs> die, right? Like the LD50 <laughs> mean lethal dose among 50 people for cannabis yeah. is off the charts, right? It's really hard to, and yes, when you look at cancer, like, Look, when they'll say, look, these cancer cells shrank, the one the one guy says in the culture in the culture, he's like, well, yeah, I can put cancer cells in a dish and I could pour, you know, uh, dish soap on it and they'll die, too. Right. That doesn't mean it cures all forms of cancer. But right. any good doctor that's actually really taking the time to educate them with cannabis will always tell you do both. Right. Yeah. Right. Do the cannabis treatment on your own. If you like the oils or therapeutics or edibles or whatever to deal with the pain, the nausea, the chemo, the appetite. Absolutely. But do not discount the traditional treatment too, right? Do not mm -hmm. just shun because like, yes, we are lied yeah. to. Doesn't mean everything in the medical world has been false, right? You had some, like almost everything in life, you had some nefarious business people that disinfected their business. So they made sure they manipulated things to hear what you wanted to hear on the cannabis side. Big pharma but, you yeah, know, and cannabis. Yep. Big pharma. But there's also a lot of good things that comes. Like there's, you know, my mom just went through cancer treatment and she's in remission. Like the cancer treatment does work, right? It doesn't, right. That doesn't work. So, and the same with cannabis treatment. There's some great results, but helping a lot of people. But we knew when we went through this, there's a lot of, there's, even uh, the girl that was in um, Charlotte Figgy that was in uh, the Charlotte's the Web, the documentary. Yeah, he passed away this last yeah. year. Right. So the cannabis doesn't heal everything. Can it be a great ailment or treatment for many things? Absolutely. But is it mm -hmm. the wonder drug that heals everything? That is just as bad as the narrative of the propaganda that was pushed by pharmaceutical, you know, prison form. They're equally as bad. And I think that's yeah. why both those documentaries turned out well, is that we were not activists trying to make a point. We were just filmmakers trying to make a great film, right? So mm -hmm. that's why I think out of all the cannabis films, the union and the culture, I resonate as the two that really connected, you know, yeah. really well, because we went into it like you guys. I was really not saying against, but I thought all the same things like makes you stupid, makes you lazy. It's far, it's far more harmful than booze. Gives you all man tits. Yeah. Decreases your erection. All those yeah. things. Listen, yeah. I, as a, as a user of that substance, I can tell you none of it's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I can also add that uh, at the age of 13, I ate a plate of brownies and slept for three days. <laughs> and I'm fine. No, on that, uh, and that is the, that, and that's the thing. So, and it's different too when you eat brownie. And whenever you eat it, it becomes yeah. like hydroxy THC because it goes through your kidneys and liver. And that's yeah. when you can have you, you, the overdose, you can overdose when you eat it, but the overdose doesn't kill you like other drugs. It'll just, either make you sleep or you'll be paranoid for a long time right that could last for three or four days. <laughs> yeah. 
Everybody said Friday that. afternoon, yeah. and then I woke up <laughs> Sunday afternoon, and my mom goes, what "Oh, good, you you're up." And I'm like, "Why? What? Are you, why are you saying that?" Well, we were going to take you to the doctor if you didn't get up before dinner. <laughs> when did when you is 48 it? hours? <laughs> you have to be so careful with edibles because even the weird thing with edibles, it just even you know habitual users or chronic users that use. You know, an edible can affect them very differently. It's a weird thing. My wife and I had yeah. this not too long ago. We got some edibles. Now it's legal. And she got some CBD ones. And my daughter had practice and stuff. She's like, here, take one of these. I'm like, no, we got practice. I got to try. She's like, it's a five milligram CBD. It's nothing. And I took it and I completely forgot. Like, I honestly didn't feel anything. Like, I had my coffee and... And then we're driving back from practice and my wife keeps like grabbing the wheel and she's like, slow down. What are you doing? Look it up for that car. And I was like, what is your problem? I'm like, quit touching me. You're going to cause an accident. And I, I totally forgot that we took it. I like honestly didn't feel anything. And then she was like, are you not fucked up from that edible? I'm like, I totally forgot we even took it. And I'm like, wow. Were you at practice like, at this time when she was grabbing you? Were you going, hey, right fuck, are you as <laughs> fucked up as me? Oh, yeah, no, it didn't she, happen to me this time. No, you have to be very careful with it. No, I, mean, I was, we talked was, about this though, numerous right times. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've so talked about this numerous times on the air. People are very, very, uh, very different in how it reacts, right? Yeah, like I, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, the way I have impacted by it can be completely different, right? Than somebody else. Yep. And and everyone's like, oh, you take this one and it'll make you sleepy. You take somebody takes that one and they want to run around the block, right? Yeah. Well, it's so. the Wild West, right? Because we've been lied to for so fucking long. Everybody's still trying to figure out dosages. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like when prohibition <laughs> ended, I'm sure they all just went like this with pints and pints and pints of as much liquor as they could. So it, it's it's sort of the same thing. But I go back to like, you know, when you watch the culture high and you watch uh the union and you you see Adam uh, and his team through both of those documentaries, when you put you put together um, the litany of dangerous lies that were told to us by big pharma through the government, through lobbyists, um, and then the relief, because you touched on it, the relief that people didn't get during that time now that they are getting. Uh, when they did have cancer or they they were suffering fucking tremendously and they couldn't eat and they couldn't sleep and there was nothing natural that they could take and they just got filled with pharmaceuticals to the point where they were non-fucking functional. Um, and and I think I, I go back to that and I, and I think it's not just a crying shame, it's like a criminal part of our history. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's really sad when you see that part and then you see where, you know, and that's where it, I, I think, you know, as much as our films helped, I think the part in both films that we were able to really connect with people, because even the most starch proponents or opponents of cannabis getting legalized or regulated uh, mm -hmm. couldn't argue when we were talking about people's health and people dealing with pain. They, right. you know, the same people that advocate for their rights are like, well, how can I determine the rights of that person when the person's like, I've gone through all the treatments and the opioids don't work and this doesn't work. And I don't want to take something that's super addictive and could kill me with an overdose. I'd much rather like cannabis works for me. How can you argue someone, even if it is just anecdotal and it just makes them feel better when you have chronic illness or chronic pain and something just makes you feel better. Like why, why would you take that away from somebody, right? That could Relief. be the difference of them surviving or dying. And that's where even the, the starchest opponents in both films, when we show, you know, when we show uh, Jaden in the culture and we show Greg Cooper, who has really bad MS in mm -hmm. the union, that they were like, yeah, I just, I just can't, I can't agree with that point, but I don't agree with all your other points. Like it's, it's those things and people being accessed. We kind of talk about that in culture. People have an access to video and able to share these stories online and then going viral. I think it was what really tipped the scales because then mm -hmm. other people that started having kids with autism or severe epilepsy and things like that, when they were yeah. at wit's end and were, you know, just like do anything to see their kid not suffer, they were like, well, let's try it. And when they even get a little bit of results, how are you going to deny any parent from helping their kid? Right. Yeah. You know what I find interesting too on the kids side of things, Adam, is yeah. the conversation now about when you should start smoking on a regular basis. And even the most, even the most regular users that I know go, I I don't want my kid doing this. I I, I want them to they grow up till they're twenty five. You know what yeah. I mean? Or at, at least till they're twenty one before they start smoking on a regular basis. So. There's been that, and I grew up a bit differently than maybe you two did. It wasn't evil in my life, 
Like it wasn't something that was presented as as clearly uh, not because your mom left a pound of fucking brownies on the <laughs> counter for you to eat when you were thirteen. <laughs> yeah. Wait, hey, wait till you hear the story about the PCP cake. <laughs> PCP so. Cake. <laughs> well, yeah, you're from the keys originally there, aren't you? Long yeah, I yeah, I had hippie print. There was no PCP. <laughs> yeah. I may have ate a box of gravel. That's what he's yeah. talking about. Oh, well, that'll make you but, see some crazy shit. Oh, yeah. dude, I was trying to explain it. They're all laughing at me. Oh, so yeah, you're six and you took a whole box of gravel. Great story. Um, yeah. But no, I was fucked up. I was twisted. So anyway... And I remember it. I have a vivid memory of yeah. uh, of being whacked out on gravel because I ate like 10 of them from the box when I was whining. Oh. My mom just threw them into the back of the car. And said, Shut up. So anyway, I grew up in a situation As where most it was great parents do when their kids are annoying. They throw drugs at them to take. That's I'm a great. proponent of drugging your children, especially when you're traveling. <laughs> anyway, do sorry, not do not do not sell that short. If you're on a plane with a kid under the age of three, drug the shit out of them. Yeah. You're doing yourself every <laughs> else a favor. <laughs> so anyway, it wasn't I, I a prefer, bad. I it wasn't a bad thing that fight. we when we grew up, right? Like my stepdad smoked every day, um, and so I, I have a very different perspective of it. If anything, I was I was living in a world where they were warning us about alcohol which is probably why I became a raging drunk, right? Well, you're, you're, well, but you, the lock, that's a rarity, right? Because most families, that would always be the hypocrisy. Even for us, when we were making the films, you start just looking at the way labels of drugs and stuff are, because I grew up, like my dad owned nightclubs. I was, I was working Kojak when I was 16. I was working the door when I was 18. I was bartending when I was 19. In BC, liquor laws were 19. Um, so I couldn't work in the red zone until then, but you know, it was like, oh, you shouldn't do that. But here, we'll give you shooters, you know, which causes like, like alcohol causes more domestic violence than like any other drug, hands down. It is the most destructive mm -hmm. thing in families. Talk to even families with functional alcoholics. Right. That's something that's something that's still shifting. I, I have, you know, I have um, my I have family members that are in recovery and alcohol seems to be the one that we still accept because it's a socially acceptable thing that it's okay and what a functioning alcoholic is there's a lot of them that really aren't functioning but because they're not carrying a brown paper take that back with the bottle like you see <laughs> lock's the only one but dude <laughs> yeah. lock's the only one yeah, yeah. sorry not, not functioning brown bag go ahead didn't mean brown to bag. You off. but you know yeah. just our perception when you think of an alcoholic you think of like what you see in the movies like normally it's either someone beating their kids or like carrying right. a brown paper bag or but what can also happen, and this is where I was moved, I went to one of my friends for his 10 year cake and there was the, he was the Surgeon General of the Okanagan was up there and he talked about how his family came to approach him to say, dad, you have a problem. And he literally, like he justifies most of us, he's like, I just did a triple bypass heart surgery on like a child. I save people's lives. I don't have a drinking problem, but his own children are like, that's great. And you're super successful in business. But when was the last time you came to one of our sports games? When did you, when was the last time you sat down and had a deep conversation with us or through the ball, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he would come home and he would drink himself, not to any kind of violent stupor, wouldn't beat anybody, would just, you know, would be negligent of his family. He would work really right. hard. Then he'd come and drink and go to bed and get up early and start all over again. And that negligence can be just as destructive to a family as actual physical beating and stuff like that. And it's a common thing with alcoholics that we look at, they're like, well, they didn't crash their car. They didn't do anything like this. I'm like, okay, but how about just starting fights at your Christmas family dinner, right? And then you guys don't talk to each other for four years. Okay, I've only done that, that a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, as long as you were in, as long as it was in good fun, Locke, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, as long as you meant it. As yeah. long as you Who wanted hasn't to do fought it? the uncle that stole the toilet paper? Right? Yeah, that's I a mean, legit fight. On. That's yeah. a legit fight. Yeah. yeah. Um, you bring up a great point. And I have a, a plethora of experience with alcohol and, and um, had to <laughs> like um, had to fucking go, whoa, 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 <laughs> about four years ago because I was so fucked. Like I was just literally fucked. I was fucked because I would get up in the morning and feel like shit because I drank too much. And then the only thing that would make me feel better is having another drink, um, you know, and, and then pretty soon you're Get emotionally not available and you're doing one of these when you're eating. I didn't, I never got to the shake point. I just drank too much. And so because I drank too much, I was fucking uh, completely unavailable to everybody. 
you know, yeah. I never got into a domestic dispute. I never got violent. Um, but I certainly started arguments and conversations just based on the fact that I was fucking shit faced. It was oh, kind of what I did. That what back, I, Dean. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you never, I never heard about you starting any shit. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you wonder if I was hosed at work, doesn't it? Um, no, but I never, I never, um, I never stopped to consider, and, and it was when I after I watched your documentary, and it was years after it came out, um, and I started like trying to figure out, can I get some replacement therapy for this? Because I don't think I can just stop doing everything. Like, I was just, <laughs> I'm being fucking serious. You want the truth? Hey, I'm gonna I'm quit. Answer. I'm gonna need another vice. <laughs> but the way I looked at it after the fact, I was like, <laughs> oh my god, this is actually good for you. Yeah. Your body has cannabinoid cell in its cellular system. It, it's attached to your DNA and your structure. Um, and the more of it I can get into me and the more strains I can get, the less oh. stressed out I have to be about not living a lifestyle of actually going out and doing something fun. You know what I mean? Does that no, sound I, weird? No, it's, no, it doesn't sound weird at all. And the, and killing himself laughing. So it's, is it a, a term? Is that an actual fucking term though? Replacement therapy? Well, oh, sure. Like, Absolutely. Well, it okay, is. okay. I don't know about that, but, but here, is now. But all jokes aside though, you know what a lot of people replace it with not knowing it's therapy is they, they eat themselves in our culture to oh. bad ends. Right. So a lot yeah. of people are like, okay, I don't do any drugs, but it's like, but then they eat like shit and they binge eat and they overeat and they don't exercise. Like, it's really interesting when you start going down the path and you talk to all these addiction specialists and you start looking at, you know, how all of it, and that's where, you know, not getting too far down the rabbit hole of the, the drug docs we did is that prohibition has been a colossal failure because addiction all stems from mental illness and you're trying to self-medicate at some point, right? It doesn't, and we say mental illness, everybody thinks it's got to be some, ex, you know, some crazy story like you are molested or you're abused you can just have social anxieties or insecurities that can cause you to when you come into contact with a certain drug it becomes your crutch and the perfect yep. example when we learned about this was talking to doctors and you look at one of the most addictive substances in the world opioids right and some people they go for a surgery and never did drugs in their whole life but they get a surgery and they find and boom they find they get introduced to opioids yeah. and then they're mm -hmm. hooked for years right you know what the numbers are what? One and four have a potential, and not everyone, you know, um, you know, eats Opioid their addiction? mortgage. Or, yeah, it's yeah. one in four have the potential of a severe addiction, and again, it's all, it's all, it's all relative. Right. Uh, not, not every one of those one ends up, you know, remortgaging their house and yeah. ruining their lives or whatever. Right. But there's that that number. It's twenty five percent. It's really high. And then yeah. you can have somebody else, like for instance, me, like for whatever reason, opioids don't connect. Like every time I've had, I've had some pretty, I've had my jaw broken and I've had things where I've had to take opioid. And I usually, when they say, oh, use these for the next two weeks, I use it for the first day of the surgery. And then I muscle it out with like I'm the same way. Tylenol or whatever. Like I, they, I don't like them. They make me feel real groggy and I don't sleep right. And like, I don't like them. Thank you. I get sick, like yeah, violently get, ill yeah, from them. Like yeah. emotionally. But you I get guess, bunged up too, right? Yeah, yeah, the shit, yeah, yeah, the shit thing. Yeah. yeah. And and I can take like there's there's certain um there's certain things I can handle, extreme pain I can handle. I I I just can. I am fortunate I've broken my back, I've done I've broken my ankle a million times, different bones, and, and I haven't noticed. So maybe it's the thing with me, but what I can't handle, what I cannot ha I've had dental surgery where I I've just taken Tylenol after this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um I can't handle not going to the bathroom i have to be able to poop not pooping is like i panic like sheer panic sets in when i anytime i'm like i think it's been like seven hours i haven't taken it <laughs> so that's that th that part of it scares me away but what people don't understand is that we've come so far even just since the documentary even since we've had uh the legalization of the product we've come so far that that cannabis actually can replace your opioid therapy. Yeah. Like it, it literally well, you, you can. That's why they call it replacement therapy. You saw that in a lot of states where you're really trying to make this stick, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> replacement therapy. Replacement therapy. Yeah. Put it out in the ether enough and it'll stick, eh? Replacement <laughs> therapy. Yeah. No, but they they have they've replaced opioids with like super high I concentrated yeah. cannabis. Yeah. 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 I think well, it's a smart well, it's thing. Very, yeah. Well, and, and just how destructive opioids are. I mean, that's you know, even now you're seeing trickles of not too much 
it's been covered in the media too well because COVID's covering everything. But COVID, the, the opioid deaths in Alberta and BC have almost surpassed COVID. They're right. They're pretty close. Like I think they uh, are in BC. Yeah, it's it's bad. Yeah, they're higher. Didn't they just set a record in BC for um, every year? For the month of it. February. For every the month of February for, for opioid deaths. For this year. Yeah. Oh, it we're, did. We're, we're way here too. Yeah. What's Alberta that number? And but Alberta's at an all time high. What's that number? Oh, it's uh, it last over it, it in in Alberta. It's over a thousand uh, up to like November, December, or January. Yeah. It's where normally it's around four to five hundred. It's doubled. Why right? was it? Why is eighteen hundred ringing a bell for me for the I year for last BC. year? I think that's BC. Okay. Yeah. I just I, we we saw the numbers not long ago and had a conversation right. on air about it because. There is a lot of conversation right now about, okay, you're locking everybody down for the sake of COVID, which, and I'm not, I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm saying, uh, you know, I'm saying this is the argument on the other side of the fence, but how much impact is this having on our mental health as a society and how many people are we losing because of addiction issues? And, and is it, is it fair? Why are we ignoring that when we're so hyper focused on? COVID? There's, there's, there's no yeah. argument there, Locke. That we're definitely we're putting so much emphasis on one thing that there's yeah. a lot of stuff. Like I have a few friends that are police officers here in Edmonton. They're like Adam. The domestic disputes and violence is off the chain. They're like we can yeah. go through ten calls a week right now. So you know, even a few doctors I've debated with this. I'm like, hey, look, I get it. It's a public health crisis. But how many other health things are we just pushing to the wayside to only yeah. focus on one right now that we're not seeing the bigger picture? We're right? making a lot of mistakes. I think they know Tons. that though. Tons. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and you know what? It came out in in this trial that's going on out here. They're they're looking into how the government has been dealing with the COVID nineteen um, response. Uh, especially when our long-term care homes. Um, so that's part of that. What has come out is if, if <laughs> because we're so fucking behind the times behind in vaccines and the variants are out, they've said, uh, listen, if you've got a, if you've got a child and he tests positive, they, they need to, they need to seriously get inside a room and stay there by themselves for 14 fucking days, 14 days. And, and this, kind of broke last week and I had people emailing me and I had people tweeting me, Dean, can you, can you say something about this? This is wrong. Our kids shouldn't be trapped in his room for 14 days. And what I would say to them is the same thing I'd say to everybody. Use some fucking common sense. Yeah. If you got two parents, someone go in the room with them um, yeah. or, or, you know, mandate the basement yeah. to be part of it. Like people and the other, cause the other part of this is people are, are, are so scared and stupid that they will literally follow these things to a T if they're told to, and they don't realize now. And I, I, I attribute these opioid deaths and the, and the, the skyrocketing number in opioid deaths in Canada to that very thing, which is, you know, it, this has obviously hurt our mental health as, as a country. Mm -hmm. This has made people depressed. It's made people anxious. It's made people alone that were alone before. They're more Think alone than they've ever been. Losing jobs too, right? Losing Dean? jobs, losing yep. family, drinking more, taking more. I mean, this is this is coping mechanism 101, the time that we're in, right? Am I not mistaken? So it's got to yeah. have something to do with it. 100%. Yeah, my, my drinking has totally gone up, right? I mean, and I'm, I'm living a fairly normal life. So, um, and, and I'm not, I'm not an anxious person at all. I, I've got lots of mental you issues. You want to talk about it? Yeah, <laughs> we could get into it, but I just found it? myself, all right, well, I guess night's over. Let's go down to the basement, watch some hockey and drink some more beer. But yeah. that's I how was, everybody is though. That's, that's, that's how we all have been because like we, the option of us going out and getting sick isn't there. Well, I'm going to go chance it and go out and hang out with my friends. No, if you're responsible, you haven't been. So what has that done to us? It's a fucking weird deal, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's interesting, though, is there's a, there's a guy, and I know his, his handle sounds dumb, but there's this one doctor I listen to that's now a YouTube guy called ZDog MD, and he's had a whole bunch of specialists on and people talking about the lockdowns and some really fascinating points that for me as a layman that we, what keeps happening with all of this is that, even journalists, and this is where they, they give the, the, and Locke, you and I have talked about this before, the negative side about the media, and it's this big overlord, but you have young people working, or regular people in media, that it's all about being first nowadays, not about being right. So when they right. get information, yeah. medical information, that they don't know how to, how to articulate correctly, they kind of get the Cole's notes, be like, this variant, this much, boom, 
they publish it right and then you know of course two weeks later it should have been retracted or there's some major errors right that this this site that i listened to he just goes through the data really well and explains some things really really well but it's interesting hearing a lot of all just saying that the negative impacts from the lockdowns you know we're only just starting to see what happened from those and you're starting to hear like this like domestic violence the open other things that we've been so fixated it's a it's right. interesting perspective to hear it from other people that I've, I, I've opened my eyes just like, wow, I guess because I'm still trying to just work, maintain, do what I can and, and follow all the guidelines I can. But it's crazy to your point to see where some people have followed. Even when you really read the guidelines, you're kind of like, what? This this one contradicts itself. Number two contradicts yeah. Yeah. number three. How, how can you follow? They've done a lot of that. Right? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, like in uh, in in Alberta, um, Dean. I don't know if we talked about this on Tuesday, but they did a um, a phase one and a half. They're calling it not a phase two reopening. So mm -hmm. they're telling gyms you can open, but you can't have strenuous workouts. <laughs> hey, I've had some of the, like, <laughs> like that's that's where you almost think you're in a Saturday Night Live like like skit because you're like, are they just being yeah. goofy? Did they just hire awesome. some kid to be like go to the gym? But you can't work out strenuously, and then what? They if you see anybody over like, fifty percent effort, you need to stop them, Jimmy. Stop that, them like, from strenuously exactly, exercising. Exactly. Like okay? what okay. the fuck? But then, Come it, on. but it's like it's like okay, they can lift heavy weights, but they can't run on the treadmill because one is considered more strenuous than the other. But like, who's who's Adam? Who's going to follow all those rules? The oh, strenuous like, police. Yeah. Well, here's the, here's the thing: is I've I've had a few friends too, and the interesting thing that when you learn about language, so my office is now above a law firm, and a lot of the times when they put out rules, it isn't even what they meant for them to be inferred to. They're like, well, no, that's not how we meant that law to be written. They're like, but that is how it's written, so you can't like, and they get frustrated, and then you see government officials wanting to make an example out of you because you followed the law to the letter better than they understand it. And then that's where you see this manipulation of it happen, right? Where you're like, no, 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 your job is public health. Your job isn't to get mad at me because I understand language better than you or that how this is written. You don't try yeah. to get me for some other infraction because I proved you wrong, right? Or that I'm standing my ground or holding my rights and not getting anybody sick. It's a very interesting thing here. I, I heard this on another podcast. It's called the ability to flex dominance on others, right? Where math, mm -hmm. you idiot, mm -hmm. you're killing my grandmother, idiot. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not doing anything. I'm following all the guidelines to the way they're written. I'm not killing anyone. Yeah. I do wear a mask. I do all those things. But it's an interesting, and social media is, of course, heighten this to a way that we could have never expected right we're really i love when i love when people fun. give us all that information in like a cartoon meme and the source yeah. is like <laughs> at jenny rainbow 55 I know. <laughs> and everybody goes wow it's gotta be I, true oh, at jenny God, rainbow I had, 55 i had one of these with my family member and they're like it's right on the fda website i'm like where i'm on the fda website i don't see it they're like here's the link and I'm, if i punched in the link manually i'm like that doesn't go to the FDA website where you're going, no. right? Like, you have to be very careful. Like, like, as docs, I have a little bit of experience with this because, you know, we don't have it so much with bio docs. Like, there you follow the history and you interview the people. But when we did it on cannabis, like, you have to have report after report that goes to – and the best thing is to always go to medical studies, not any kind of – now, like, you used right. to go by the New York Times and everything's a gold standard. But now you go to medical studies because they're – you know, a lot of times you just have doctors and, and, and they're scientists. definitive. Yeah. yeah and they're nerds That's and they Dean does that. Dean does yeah. a lot. Cause I hear That's him. That's all quoting. I do. That's yeah. all yeah. I do. I do journal of American medicine. I do Johns Hopkins university for four years. I wouldn't touch the CDC website cause Trumpy had his hands in there. Yeah. Um, but now I'm back on the CDC website. I find that if you're going to educate yourself and I said this to someone the other day, um, you know, misinformation being one of the biggest issues that we suffer from today and, and the way people take it, you yeah. know, like you, you talk about uh, your rights and being able to interpret the language of a law better than, um, you know, a health professional. People weaponize that. People then yeah. take that ability and they weaponize yeah. it for their own narrative, right? Which is really yeah. the problem that we have is they'll take that information, weaponize it and say, well, the language is wrong. So fuck you. These are my rights. Yeah. Um, but what I've really found specifically over the last couple of years is that the only way that you can actually have a conversation with anybody that doesn't believe in fact is to shut up and listen because you'll you're never going to you're never no. going to convince them i'm not going to i'm not going to bring up all my source articles from the journal of american medicine in the middle of some guy's garage at a at a at a party no. um so so that's not going to happen but what i found it has done it is i find that i respect even my friends 
like my friends that I've known for 20, 30 years. I've had guys I went to grade school with send me hate mail. I've had guys that I went to high school with. My No word of a lie. Corey Kingwell is the dude's name. I went to high, grade school with him in Rosetown, Saskatchewan. He sent me this thing about the Proud Boys just being good Canadian guys. And I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me. Um, and then my buddy Garth Murdoch, who I grew up with, went to private Christian high school with, born again Christian high school with. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? Where did you learn your shit? This is bullshit. We're fucking stick to your education. And I'm like, oh, my God, no one's involved. Um, but, That's why but, I only get information from TMZ. Yeah. Oh, well, he's got the best one. <laughs> Breitbart. You yeah. Got, you're, yeah. You're, you're, you're like Men in Black, the hot sheets. That's what it's real, yeah. though, right? So, you know. <laughs> hey, I, I got a way of getting us into another uh, topic here. You, um, you've been filming quite a bit, Adam. Right. I have. Through the through COVID. Yep. And you've been filming in the states, right? Correct. Yep. And um, have you found that there is a decided difference between the two countries and how they're handling COVID from a business perspective? I mean, we, we can all have, we can have a conversation about running into somebody in the in the grocery store that's having a fight with the you know the guy behind the lettuce about not wearing a mask. But I yeah. mean, what about business wise? Yeah, it was interesting. So we, my team just traveled recently with the recent laws. They just went down. They're in New Jersey doing some research right now. And now you have to get the negative test before you go and the negative test when you, when you arrive and then when you come back. And, you know, I, I could go off on that too, where it's like, I, I kind of had this debate with the nurse the other day because my daughter had a close contact and we went and got the test. And then I'm like, okay, well, so when we're negative, we're negative. She's like, well, not really. You still have to isolate and you have to do it. I'm like, oh, so the test doesn't work for early detection then is what you're saying. She's like, well, no, it does. I'm like, well, it clearly doesn't because if it says she doesn't like, I'm like, it, it sucks it, being smarter than most people, doesn't well, I it? Just want to, like, but I just, I was trying to figure it out because it's our first time having to do a close contact. And I'm like, no, well, clearly it doesn't because why would she then have to isolate? And they're like, well, we're just, I'm like, listen, I, I just want to get the test and I want to go through, but that, that really doesn't make sense. But my team going to the States, when we went down for the Olympia, it's pretty straightforward. The States, we always get a whole, we have to do a whole bunch of stuff anyway. We have to get pocket letters that show that we're a Canadian company employing Canadians and then we're hiring a few Americans. That's usually what they're worried about most, right? Are you taking jobs away from Americans? So as long as we show that we're a Canadian company employed by employing Canadians, we're coming down there just for the subject matter and spending money, they're fine. Then we have to get a carnet for all our gear to make sure that we're not trying to sell it there and make some kind of border transfer that it, whatever gear we're bringing in is coming back. Um, so on the way there, when we went at Christmas time was nothing, we went right in, they were like, Oh, cool. You guys are going to the Olympia. I hope Phil Heath wins this year and blah, blah, blah. And like, they didn't care. Uh, we, we got tested like crazy down there because we are trying to follow, we all had to get COVID certified. Uh, that yeah. was part of our production court and to be around all the athletes, none of us would feel healthy. Like we'd be feel horrific if we got anybody sick and they weren't able they had to pull out of the tournament so you know we got tested before we went in we got tested once we arrived we got tested after three days again we got tested when we switched states like that's why you saw some of my posts we were all making fun and getting tested constantly down there and then we mm -hmm. wore masks and did our thing and you know um but like nashville and and florida was not everything was like wide open and it like people wore masks for the most part but it was not, hmm. it, it was interesting to see because you're almost like, is it even here? Because like, they don't talk about it down here, right? Like, it's like, we did always did our part and did as safe as we could and most people wore masks. And, you know, even when I was down there, I was like, well, their hospitals must be just like overflowing. And they were busy, but none of them were like, you know, panicking hmm. like they are here. Like, like it, it made you question a little bit. I've always been for the socialized healthcare. Yeah. But down there, you know, I, and again, I'm not getting to this because you can go on that forever, but they obviously they have way more hospital beds, right? So they were never really like a lot of places were other than New York and stuff when it hit, were really bursting at the seams. And interestingly enough, you know, just a, 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 a dummy documentarian observation now is that even places that have been wide open for a while versus places that have been locked down, like plat like cases are just plateauing kind of everywhere right now, right? Yeah. Whether they've been open or closed. So a lot of we're all just kind of saying like, man, this thing was going to run its course regardless of how much we did, right? It's really hard to pinpoint how much was helped and how much wasn't, right? By mm -hmm. doing lockdowns, it's a, but, you know, when we traveled to Florida, we came back and then it was interesting coming back because we had the exemptions and everything. And they were like, oh, oh you're, you guys applied for exemptions and your paperwork, go ahead. And we're kind of want to ask like where we So you didn't or, even get tested when you came back in? We did. We all wanted to, right? Like we keep yeah. doing more to be just 
do our part because I I wouldn't feel. I oh, don't you, care if oh, I'm you're dead. talking about common sense, Adam. You talking yeah, about common yeah. sense? <laughs> you, you you run your your life and business as if you have common sense. Is that correct? I try. I try my best. <laughs> okay, my, just my checking. Wife at times yeah, will probably say I don't have a lot of common sense, but sure, I try my best. <laughs> so, but no, it was interesting coming back before <laughs> this last time where you know we had all the paperwork and they said go ahead and they're like we'd still yeah. like to get the test because we're about to be around our families. Then when we came home, of course, like I said to my wife. I'm like, hey, do you want me to go in the basement? Not. And she's like, Adam, it's Christmas. School's like, we're not going anywhere. Like, as if the kids are going to just want you sitting in a basement. Like, girl brain. We'll all just sit home until you come back negative. And then, and then I had my results pretty quick. Within 48 hours, they're like, you're negative. And then I went for another test five days and I was negative again. And then, you know, from there, we just lived normally, right? I figured two negative tests within five days was good enough to say I was negative. Hey, so. hey, did did when you when you offered to stay in the basement and your wife declined, were you a, a little bit upset? <laughs> I was like, damn, I could have just watched Netflix and done my own. Be thing. honest. Like, yeah, that wasn't gonna go <laughs> Be <far>. honest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, you tell have me a about this family than mine. Yeah, me too. Tell me about your <laughs> Bisping documentary because, um, I know you've been talking about it, and, and, uh, and, and Adam Scorgi's our guest, uh, documentary maker, filmmaker. Um, I, I'm very interested in it because um, I'm not a massive MMA fan, uh, but I follow a couple of MMA guys, and, and, and Mike Bisping's one of them. Uh, so tell me a little bit about uh, the doc. So Bisping is honestly one of the best guys I've worked with. Him and Grant, uh, Dan, I know we've been fortunate to work with a lot of great guys, but Bisbing and I really connected because we're the same age. He's like a year older than me. He's been with his wife, you know, ever since they were young, like I have. They have three kids. And I Bisbing was one of those guys, like when I first watched, and I'm an avid UFC fan, and I watched yeah. from the original Ultimate Fighter shows when he was on, I think, season two or season three. And I hated him. Me and my wife wanted to see him lose. We kept being like, kick that cocky Brit's ass, right? Like, but he knew he <laughs> sold himself as the villain because whether you tuned in to hate him or whether you tune in to support him, you were tuning in to watch him. You have an emotional connection. He under he was before Conor McGregor, before Chael Sonnen, before any of these guys. He was really the first guy that knew how to get you emotionally charged for a fight. Um, and when you really go through all the injuries, Locke, you've seen it now that he went through, he is the real life Rocky story only yeah. greater. What he accomplished as a champion to me makes him the greatest well, fighter and, and, that's ever competed. Because something else that And we a lot know, of the injuries we knew about, but we didn't know about a lot of them, right? Didn't know to the extent, right? Like a lot of people knew his eye was bad. Yes. But they didn't know to what, because he only released that in yeah. like I, seven, seven, eight months ago, he pulled out his glass eye on his podcast and everyone was like, what? We're like, Biz! He's going to save that for the film. He's like, ah, I was getting into an argument with someone. And I was like, ah, and I showed him. And like, <laughs> but as you got from the film lock, the part that's really, is you just really see how personable and likable he is. Like everyone that watches is like, man, like, yes. how do you not like this guy? He's just a great guy. And like, even then, like every time I go to LA now, like I make a point when if he's in town, we're getting together for beers because he's just so fun to be around. He's, charismatic he's is he winning. calling uh 259 adam is he doing ufc he is, 259 I think this weekend he's only doing the prelims though uh because he works for ESPN, oh, okay so i think he's doing the prelims and then the pay-per-view will be joe rogan now i i don't know dean if you watch much but um he's he's really good i mean everyone talks about rogan and rogan's awesome and i don't want to take anything away from what rogan brings to the table when he's doing the call but uh i think bisbing is just as just as entertaining entertaining as as any of them cast and i actually he, i have I, I look forward to seeing him on there he's becoming quickly one of the big fan favorites man like he just you know being a fighter he can you know mm -hmm. he can weigh in so well about what guys are going through and the delicacies of how to correct somebody that's making some errors in there but in an, in a way as an athlete can respect that what he's not doing he's a little gun shy he's been there and and because Bisping had such a tumultuous like career with the injuries and overcoming, and everybody wrote him off, everybody wrote him off that he would never win a title, other than maybe his major family and his boxing coach, Jason Perillo. I mean, he was like a 12 to 1 underdog when he fought Luke Rockhold. Nobody thought he had, and that, and that, they were giving him that bad of odds without knowing that he was blind and had no depth perception, right? In one eye. Like they were yeah. writing him off completely. So I think when he commentates now, they just give him such a like, Everyone, and now that they're seeing him on his Facebook, I see it all the time on his Twitter. People are like, man, I hated you when you fought. And now you're like my most favorite guy to fall, like 
follow. Like he's just mm-hmm. really fun, yeah. witty, makes fun of himself. And it was an honor to tell his story. It's almost what, when he's doing the call, he's almost talking to the fighters and they yeah. actually sometimes talk back to him because yeah. with the new, with, with no fans, they, yeah. you can, they can hear each other. Like they're ringside. Yeah. Eh? And, yeah. and there's, there's been a couple of times it's like, I think he just fucking talked to Bisming or like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting <laughs> that dynamic. I, it was hard to watch at the beginning because you could hear the, like, yeah, like the, you could hear it. And it was just like, Oh, Ooh, yeah. that sounds awful. You get used to that and you can, you can move on. Um, and now, now I'm sort of, <laughs> I'm interested in it. Well, I, I mean, it's, I had, I had a tough time with UFC, especially, um, especially the, the women. I don't know, man. Like I had, I had a really hard time watching the women kick the shit out of each other. Yeah. Well, dude, it's, but yeah it's, on, a, it's a violent nice. sport, man. They, yeah. what's they're that? warriors, right? They, they, they almost fight harder. Yeah. I find the women to kind of prove that they oh. still belong there and not that they have to, I mean, they're incredible athletes and warriors, but man, their fights, so many of them, even if you get like two relatively unheard of fighters, like they're action packed in the way they go after each other. It's uh well, I think because it means something like, if, you know, I, I've watched several. I, I mean, yeah. I'm not a, an appointment guy. If there's a pay-per-view, if it's McGregor, um, I'll watch it. I've, 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 I've rented like maybe six or seven pay-per-view UFC fights in my life. Yeah. So you, I, I you may want to get into this, this one conversation this weekend. Like you guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is yeah. a good card. Oh, this yeah. Weekend. It's three title fights and uh, son. Yeah. It, it'll be a good one. Yeah. Okay. Um, but. Uh, I love stories because, like, what people don't realize is that this this league, when you come into UFC and you get a you get a, a fight, um, it doesn't pay huge. I mean, there's a scale when it comes to winners and losers and who gets paid what. Um, like, it is it's fight and fight for your life, fight for your food, fight for your next fight. And a lot of these guys come out of nowhere. A lot of these guys are stories of, you know, backyard brawlers or guys that wanted second <laughs> careers or, you know, whatever love, the situation is. This thing is essentially like that. He came from a northern town in the UK called Clitheroe, which is a nice, it's a quaint little town, but not a lot of opportunities. So young men, they get into a lot of trouble, right? They work hard during the week and then they go and get in fist fights during the weekend and you know, hopefully don't get thrown in jail. And Bisbing was one of those guys and he he said like I was never a great athlete. Like when I play football or soccer for us he's like i was always last picked i I had two left feet i wasn't a super talented athlete and even once he he's like but he could fight from a very young age he was fighting older guys he was he caught on to jujitsu really well kickboxing did really well for him and he just kept building up there and then in his career every time right as he says in the dog typical bisbing fashion he'd be a number one contender and he'd lose and he'd not only lose he'd use he'd lose in spectacular fashion badly Henderson, one of the greatest knockouts vitor belfort kicked him head kicked him, which is, you know, caused the eye damage and ultimately made him lose complete vision in that eye. Um, and the part that we, we, we pulled back a little bit on the film because Bisbing never wanted it to seem like he was complaining or using it as an excuse. But every time he was beat in that number one contender position, he was beat by a guy that tested positive for testosterone, right? Dan Henderson with uh, Vitor tested higher than anyone ever in UFC history, more than Brock Lesnar when he kicked his eye. Like that was where... <laughs> So Biz yeah. a lot of a lot of hormones. Oh, he's been starch against performance enhancing yeah. drugs. And Bisbing put it really good. It, it didn't make the film, but he talked about it. And he's like, oh, and those people that say it was a boner pill or this or that, and they made a mistake. He's like, bullshit. Because he's like, I'm no angel, and I did my fair share of partying, and I never failed one fucking piss test. So he's like, you know when you're fighting yeah. in the UFC and they're coming for you and they're testing. So when you get tested and you're a little over on test and they find this particle, he's like, and you he's like, to me, that's bullshit, right? Mm. That you were you were playing around and they because they kept getting more and more sophisticated. The one thing I'll say now, the UFC has stricter testing than like any other sport out there. They are tested way harder than NHL. NHL's drug testing is quasi joke right like, i don't think they really have drug tests they're just they, they like check in with guys and go hey you good that's yeah the- yeah <laughs> like are you, you maybe a little too you may be a little too good we might have to get you some help here or what's going on <laughs> nba too nba doesn't test for shit nba and nhl and major league baseball now they're like yeah you know we'll test for some see, hormones sports, from time to time in, but- in sports where you don't do damage to your opponent i yeah I hear the argument and when you kind of see Icarus and you hear how much this has been around forever, I'm kind of like, 
why don't you guys let's just all cheat to see the best that we can sure. push human ability, right? The only how much time... better would the hockey be if everyone was on the juice? Yeah, probably incredible. Well, and the big thing that happens with the Jew, the big misunderstanding that I've learned from my little bit of interviewing some of these guys is that the biggest thing it allows these top level athletes to do is heal, right? That's mm -hmm. the biggest thing is that they're pushing their body so hard. It allows them to heal faster than their opponents. Like, because they're all training hard. Like nowadays, mm -hmm. there's no high level athlete that isn't training like a monster. I mean, my daughter's in competitive hockey here at 14 at just double A, triple A level. She trains five, six days a week. Right. Willingly loves to do, you know, it. I don't know right. if you guys have seen the blue Jays back backup catcher, Alejandro Kirk. Have you guys no. seen him? That no. guy's a professional athlete. No. And I can guarantee you he's not knocking himself. Well, baseball, out of the gym. baseball is one of those ones. And that's where, <laughs> yeah. and that's where baseball is one of those things too, where like, I, I, I honestly, when they were like worried about them doping, I'm like, it's mm -hmm. a bat that hits a ball. Like, yeah, you, yeah. You still have to have great hand eye coordination. I could go take all, let them take Adderall in the world. I'm still never going to be able to hit a ball. <laughs> uh, speaking of um, speaking of athletes, <clears throat> you guys are both in Edmonton. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just wanted to get your thoughts on the last three games set against the Leafs. I'm in Toronto. Yep. Uh, you guys are in Edmonton. Uh, just just a few numbers yeah. to throw at you, if that's okay. Um, I'm thirteen for you. to one. Thir no, that's not a number. That's a that's an insult. <laughs> You just you just insulted me. That's that's absolutely not a number. Uh, Thirteen to one. Uh, that's uh, goals Jesus. for the Toronto Maple Leafs against uh, the um, Edmonton Oilers. Game We're one was four some nothing. Pieces. I'm not done. Uh, game one is four nothing. Game two three nothing. Game three six one. And Locke and I talked before the game yesterday, and I'm like. What do you think tonight? I think it's going to be six three, and he's like, I think it's going to be six three the other way. The Oilers are going to, win. and 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 it was again a blowout. And prior to this this series, and I know you guys are big Oiler fans, and, and if you haven't watched uh, the making of Coco, uh, the Grant Fear story, which Adam uh, made, the documentary is fucking fantastic. We'll get into it in a second, but I wanted to talk about this because it'll make you guys feel Ice better. Guardians, um, too. Ice Guardians as well, yeah, and the Bob Probert story, phenomenal. Um, like I said, he's royalty, he's documentary royalty. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but but it was it was wasn't even it wasn't even a series. It wasn't even fun to watch. It was fun to watch for me, but in a three-game statement series, this was supposed to be a statement series for you guys, by the way. Yeah. Three lift win leaf wins with three goalies, Campbell, Hutchinson, and Anderson. Outscored the Oilers 13 to 1. McDavid, no points in three straight. Dry side, he had 1.9 periods. No Matthews for the first two Total games. Out. All four lines scored. What, what, what would it expose? What happened? What I, been, what, I, what I had been saying is like a diehard fan I've been watching for, and again, I'm not an analyst or an expert, but with all the hype, even Oilers were doing good. I'm like, guys, we still have horrible defense. The team is not whole. This isn't a playoff contending team. It relies on two superstars way too much right in order to win like i mean if you look at pittsburgh that won those cups okay you had crosby and malkin but you also had like gonchar and wicked defensemen and a great goaltender and like yeah. you know we have two oilers have two average goaltenders we don't have one rock star defenseman we have a couple offensive defensemen but we don't have like a lidstrom or drew dowdy or any of those cup winning defensemen on the back and they rely on two players way too much as much as we're always like leon mcdavid leon mcdavid i'm like Man, teams that win now have fourth line lines that score, and you saw that with like even with the injuries Toronto has, it, yeah. it, it was it was like they were playing an amateur team. Embarrassing yeah. as it was they, it was like they yeah. were playing an AHL team. It was embarrassing that and, uh, you couldn't just, get Oilers couldn't get through the neutral zone for three games. It, it, it um, was, I watched it, again like first period of both, and I was like, this is so boring to watch. It wasn't I'm, a like, trap like, either. It wasn't yeah. it wasn't a traditional trap. Right, no. like they weren't yeah. they weren't locking it up like um, like New Jersey did for years. No, they just, it just four guys up at the blue line, and that would be it. I mean, yeah. you you get the puck in, and guys, are, you know what fucking amazed me yesterday too? I don't know if you saw that race to the puck between uh, Ilya Mikheyev and, uh, and, and Connor McDavid. I that 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 said something to me, and I don't want to read into it, but I'm pretty sure McDavid wants out. No. Oh. Yeah, How uh, long? I, I, man. I don't think you're wrong. Is that I mean, the narrative look, there? 
Is he's that a, like is that creeping into the narrative there about uh, about I, McDavid? Have, because yeah, I just I just think as a human it would. I mean, you have to like McDavid's the nicest young gentleman you'll meet. I've been fortunate enough to meet him a couple of times. I helped on his documentary, whatever it takes. Uh, mm-hmm. I was a consultant on that. Uh, and you want to be that diehard guy for your team and not, but like it it's I don't know how you can't it can't creep in when you're like, I don't know what more I can do if the team constantly if they don't make a big push this year, I don't know how his management because you, you you're at your time as a top level athlete is so fine, right. especially in today's NHL. It moves so quick. You're a 30 goal scorer one year, and two years later you're getting six. Yeah. The game is so fast now. The one the thing so good, like mm-hmm. it, you you start. The to one thing about it, this this team is I I I think you have to also be fair to the Leafs in that they're playing really, really well now and they're a fast, they aggressive team. team. And and I, I think the Oilers are still a decent team, even with the pieces that they they need. The defense, goalie, uh, the goaltending is questionable. Um, but I still think Dry Seidel and McDavid will drag them into the playoffs. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure they'll they'll have much life like, in the dude almost everybody's making the playoffs i mean it's yeah. <laughs> you have to be real shit to not make the playoffs in the pandemic era but um that's not even the point like i watched him i watched mcdavid uh, post game yesterday yeah just log out and log back in um i watched mcdavid post game yesterday and the the disinterest in answering any questions um i thought he matured actually i was watching him in the post game i was like my God, this guy fucking, um, he gets, he gets it. Like he is, he's fed up. He's been through five years of garbage. Um, you know, they just came off a great run before this three game set. It was prove it or lose it for the Oilers. The, the, the Leafs, I mean, you know, they're, they're 10, 12 points up, uh, on, on Edmonton after that. And all mm-hmm. I could think of when I was watching the series as, as McDavid got more frustrated, more frustrated and more frustrated was he's got to be looking across the ice at this team that is the best in the NHL by a country mile, um, having fun with guys like Thornton and Spezza and Matthews and Marner. Um, he's got to be looking across the ice going, how much longer can I do this? Yeah. Yeah. At least I think he does. No, there is I, a conversation I, in town about it. I'm sure there is. Yeah. And, and I and I think Cates I, is is well. I think it's definitely a concern. I, I think if you're a member of the management of the Edmonton Oilers, you got to be worried about at some point a conversation where they're like, "All right, this is this has got to change," or my boys heading out. Right? Yeah. I would think it does. I would think it matters. Like this, you know, depending on what happens from now to the and and I would feel terrible for the city of Edmonton growing up an Oilers fan. I really would. But I just I couldn't I couldn't get it out of my mind. And then did you guys see Drysidle post game? Did you guys see yeah. this? I want to play this no. for you. This is yeah, uh, dude. This is great. I was so happy to see this clip because I thought, good, Edmonton has asshole sports guys like we do in Toronto. This is incredible. Uh, speaking of not good enough, your top players didn't produce much of anything in this series. Does it add to the frustration that you guys uh, really didn't uh, hold up your end of the bargain? No, we love that. We love going without a point in, in three days for sure. It's great. We love that, he says. We love going three games straight without a point. I, well, I, how do you answer I, I, those I, questions anymore? Right? I know, I know. Like, dude's down. That's what he's and he's he's, just, he's like. I, 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 I'm, I'm shocked. Did you not play that on the radio this morning? I would have. I would have played no, the shit off. out of that all day. Oh, did we lose? I think we lost Adam. Gorgy, now yeah. he's like five feet wide too. Look at that shot. That's hot. Are you there? We got gotcha? you. I, uh, Dean, I gotta. I, yeah. I have to go. My connection is so bad right now. And, all right, and I'm. I, I, I keep I, losing I you. All my sound. I don't know if you guys can hear me. I can't hear anything now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear yeah. us? Can you hear us now? You got us. I think no? it's a timing issue. We're at a we're at a weird time in Edmonton or something. Or everybody's online. Okay, I all hate right, to do well, this, but dude, I, I haven't been able to keep up with it. the last five six minutes. Oh, okay, there. No you are. worries. Are you there? Are you there? You got me now. I I am here. Yeah, I am here. Yeah, I think. 
Yeah, he's having connection issues as well. No problem. We can just end the podcast. That's a great part about doing this. I'm glad we got the Oilers stuff in. You know what? Yeah, yeah. No, we we needed to get the Oilers stuff in there. It, it, It to be fair, the Leafs played well. Edmonton is in shock right now, not because anybody's surprised that the Leafs won, but how it happened. I think that's that's part of the issue, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's moving forward. I think that's going to be the discussion now. It's just like, okay, we got beat badly. Like we got exposed huge and other teams are going to pay attention to that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I guess too, you think about what, what was on the line going into that series. And um, that would frustrate the shit out of a fan base that, you know, was in second place prior to that series. Um, you know, and, and, and you still got the two best players in the world, the best high scoring duo in the world on your team. It would just be, it yeah. would just be like a, uh, one of those really shitty wake up calls, sort of like realizing one of your parents has like a massive drug addiction, you know, be like, oh, I'm never going to get out of this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that analogy. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry. I just wanted to <laughs> add that in there. Uh, anyway, we're having yeah. technical issues, so what we're going to do is uh, – well, sorry, go ahead, Adam. What you I think say? you can hear me back now. I got to actually bounce, gentlemen. Unfortunately, I got to leave. I got to yeah. pick up the, the boys get out of school early today, so I'm on daddy duty. But uh, thank you guys very much for, for having me on. I enjoy. We'll have to jump on again when I have uh, more time. We can wrap for a couple hours. Yeah, I'd like that. It was great. Great to talk to you. That was awesome, um, Adam. Bis- yeah. Bisping, the documentary, go look for it. It is uh, really, really good, as are all of his other documentaries. Adam Scorgi, uh, documentary filmmaker. Uh, where can we find you on Twitter, or where would you want people to find you if not yeah, Twitter? Yeah, Twitter's good, or Instagram, uh, either or. And on Instagram, it's just G, like uh, uh, S-C-O-R-G. And then on uh, Twitter, it's Adam Scorgi. Uh, uh, both of them, I'm pretty, as Locke knows, I'm pretty responsive on there. I'm pretty good at getting back. Uh, those are kind of my ways to get in touch with me. Feel free. And yeah, Bisbing's is exclusive. It's only available. Canadians get it before anybody else. It hasn't released worldwide yet. There's a big announcement coming there that unfortunately I'd love to share in the show, but I, I cannot. Um, similar to what happened in the past there. Super Long, Channel. Wink, wink, wink. No, but in, in Canada yeah. right now, it's available <laughs> exclusively on Super Channel. So yeah. For those of you, and then you can get you can get those that don't have Super Channel through Apple TV or Amazon. You can get the month free thing. I highly recommend it, even if you're not a UFC fan. If you're a fan of the Rocky movies and you know the real Rocky story, where a guy overcoming all adversity to do what's better for his family and really try to provide a better life for them, Bisming's story is that. If you do yeah, not, you'll like it, Dean. Fa- fall in no, love I'm, with, I- with with Bisming after the doc, then I question whether you're human. <laughs> i'm excited i just love the personality that's why i follow him but uh oh, you'll, really you'll love the, the doc even more and the people like that was the thing is even some of his biggest opponents like rockhold and him they all agreed to do it because as much as they might have hated each other in the ring there is a definite mutual admiration as a fighter and as an athlete when you go against these guys and i don't know if you were following his instagram the other day where him and rockhold are in the gym again and they're just like come on brother let's hug it out right like mm-hmm, mm-hmm, there's mm-hmm. there's definitely a, a neat respect with fighters that um they respect each other but yeah please go to super channel and tune in and Locke, I really appreciate you always like support my work and my team. It means a lot for indie guys like me. That stuff goes a long way. And thank you very much for having me on today, gentlemen. I appreciate it. You got great to have you. Adam Scorgi, uh, filmmaker, Adam. documentary maker, Adam Scorgi, uh, ladies and gentlemen, at Lachlan Cross as well uh, from 95.7 Cruise FM in Edmonton. Sorry about your technical issues. Maybe hardwire that yeah. shit next time. Yeah, I, I, I'll try to figure that out. Do I have to drill anything? Hey, everybody, no. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's everybody crying about your oilers on social media right now maybe that's yeah it. maybe that's what's up yeah i yeah all that right my narrative friend. In, that narrative in edmonton i know we got to go that narrative in edmonton's got to be fun this morning it's nice to not be on the other end of that it's like constant fucking negativity sorry it, it yeah it is it is well you guys have had your in in uh in uh in toronto 1967 yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I hate those people. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, dude. Good to see you. That was a lot of fun, my friend. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Lachlan Cross from 95.7 Cruise FM in Edmonton. Great morning show. As I scratch my nose, well, there's only a few people watching now. So thanks for watching. Thanks for being part of the program. 
Thanks to Adam Scorgi for joining us. Bisping, the name of the documentary, Apple TV, Super Channel in Canada. Make sure you get it. I'll be watching it shortly. Uh, thanks to our friends at uh, Blue Microphones, part of the Blue Network, the DeanBlundell.com network, the official microphone of DeanBlundell.com is Blue Microphones. I use the NEX, the headphones as well. You could do the same thing. Go to Blue Microphones and figure it out for yourself, especially if you're doing anything like this. You need Everybody needs a microphone. All of my kids have microphones for crying out loud. Blue Microphones. Thanks. BlueMicrophones.com. Thanks to our friends at Ed's Fine Imports. His gitch, the best underwear you'll ever wear. Uh, super comfortable boxer briefs, pouch in the front, no piling, elastic, it's terrific. It's a hearty elastic too, which is good for people like moi. But get his gitch for the uh, price of three. You can give four right now. Use promo code gitch three. Go to edsfineimports.com. Gitch and then the number three. Also, uh, domination, dominate with content by going to domination.com, dmntm.com. Um, our friend Adam made this software and it is lights out the best software you can get if you're producing content uh you can do like 70 pieces in like i don't know five minutes it's ridiculous you can try it for free go to deanblundell.com click on the domination logo at the top or go to dmntn.com try it yourself today join our newsletter at deanblundell.com as well have a great day talk to you soon thanks for being a part of this bye <laughs>